So welcome to uh, <clears throat> second full day of Mises University, 2015. You know, um, Dr. Salerno mentioned the multi-generational aspect of Mises U, and I can certainly speak to that also. <clears throat> I attended my first Mises University uh, in 1988, uh, back before a lot of you were born, I'm guessing. Uh, I know the judge made a joke last night, oh, 2000, you guys weren't born then, you all chuckled, but, but most of you really weren't born in 1988, were you? <laughs> um, okay, a few of you were. <laughs> yeah, I was only five, I was a child prodigy, uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, you know, I, back in that day, I was like you guys, right? I mean, I was young and super enthusiastic, and I would attend the lectures and discussions all day and then stay up late into the night uh, talking to the other students about what we had heard and you know, arguing arcane points of Austrian and libertarian theory. Of course, you can do all that on the internet now, which we couldn't do back in the day, but um, you know, now, look at me. Now, now I've got gray hair and got a little bit of a bigger belly and uh, you know, when the four o'clock in the afternoon lecture slot comes around, I'm thinking, <sighs> about time to hit the sack now. <laughs> um, but uh, back in that day, uh, it wasn't called Mises University, but, uh, and it was smaller than we have now. And when I attended my first one, the lecturers were Murray Rothbard, of course, as the principal speaker, but also David Gordon, uh, Roger Garrison, and Hans Hermann Hoppe. And then when the next couple of years, we added uh, Joe Salerno and Walter Block and Jeff Herbner, Bob Higgs, and many others, you know, who are still here today. Now, of course, they're, these guys are here this week kind of, you know, doddering around, uh, <laughs> mostly lucid, at least, you know, part of the time. Um, so some of you, you know, 20, 25 years in the future, it may be the ones up here giving the lectures. And, you know, I'll be the one out there in my little, little electric chair thingy, you know, like, <laughs> like, you, like at Walmart. Um, I, so I, some of my own PhD students uh, are now doing research and teaching in Austrian economics. And I, I'm, I'm sure we'll soon be teaching at Mises U in coming years, already writing for Mises.org and so on. So it really is great to see the Austrian movement as a sort of self-perpetuating one. And um, we're so excited to be here this week with all of you guys um, and to watch you in the coming years to see what you decide to do. And you know, this is sort of my inspirational uh, um, you know, call uh, to, to you to you know, pursue excellence and to take what you've learned and think about it and reflect on it, add to it, challenge it, build upon it, uh, whatever you decide to do, whatever career path uh, you undertake, uh, know that you're sort of standing on the shoulders of giants, um, just as all of us who are doing this today have stood on the shoulders of those who came, came before us. Now, if you decide to become a professor or a writer or a journalist, or for that matter, a musician or a business person or uh, an, an artist or an engineer, whatever, you will be making, in an important sense, an entrepreneurial decision, right? Because you will be pursuing specific objectives, um, but when you employ the means to achieve those ends in the future, when you employ the means today to achieve those ends in the future, you won't know with precision, you won't know exactly, you won't know with certainty whether your ends will be achieved, right? So you're exercising some sense of cognitive judgment about what the future may bring and the extent to which things that you do now can help to bring about that uncertain future. That's the essence of entrepreneurial decision making, as we'll see in just a moment. Now, it's a, it's a pleasure for me to speak to you about entrepreneurship because it's an extremely important topic, not only within the Austrian tradition, but within uh, uh, the, the wider world, the academic world, the policy world, the business world. Um, you know, there's lots and lots of discussion about entrepreneurs, about entrepreneurship, uh, the role that entrepreneurship plays in society, <clears throat> the functions of the entrepreneur, etc. In the popular media, <clears throat> uh, in mainstream economics, 
uh, in all kinds of uh, all kinds of aspects. I mean, there are a lot of you know famous entrepreneurs who are well known. Their activities are you know closely tracked. They're reported in 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 the newspaper. You know, not not just in Entrepreneur Magazine, which has a very explicit interest in people like Mr. Branson, but you know, in the New York Times and wherever. Um, you know, some well-known entrepreneurs are not only you know, widely respected, but almost revered. Um, of course, there are other entrepreneurs who are not quite so revered, but... Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the problem that mainstream economists have faced is trying to reconcile the increasing interest in entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship within society at large with the lack of an explicit treatment of the entrepreneur in their theories, right? So in mainstream economics, neoclassical economic theory, in the standard textbooks, both inter beginning, intermediate, and advanced, in the academic journals and so on, there's kind of an awkwardness with regard to entrepreneurship. So mainstream economists recognize that the entrepreneur is an important actor in society, like these people and others, uh, but these economists don't quite know how to incorporate the entrepreneur into their theories, theories that are based on uh, describing equilibrium conditions you know, with mathematical precision and so forth. It's not obvious where to include the entrepreneur in mainstream micro and macroeconomic theories. In fact, I mean, I even did some empirical research myself. I looked in some textbooks that I had uh, within easy reach. It wasn't a big uh, research project. I just reached uh, up uh, to my bookshelf and looked in the indexes of some of the leading textbooks. And this is, I think this is Varian's intermediate micro text. Um, you notice that the word entrepreneur does not even appear in the index, right? So not only it do, are we lacking a detailed analysis of the role of the entrepreneur in microeconomics? The textbook writers don't even mention the word. They don't mention the word even a single time. Okay, so somebody who is looking out at the real world and, and you know, trying to figure out uh, what, is, what are people like Branson and Jobs, et cetera, what are they doing, uh, how do they influence the market and so forth, will find no help whatsoever in contemporary economics textbooks, aside from those written by you know, members of the Austrian school. Um, of course, it's very different within the Austrian tradition. Um, uh, Tom DiLorenzo, in his opening talk, uh, he quoted Mises, a reference that Mises made to the relationship between the entrepreneurs and uh, the consumers. And note that Tom, in his lecture, did not even, you know, think it necessary to elaborate. And why is Mises mentioning the entrepreneur here? It just, you know, it just sort of rolls off the tongue, because within the Misesian system, the entrepreneur is, as Mises himself put it, the driving force of the market. Mises once wrote, you know, it is impossible to eliminate the entrepreneur from the picture of a market economy. Did you, did you catch that? I mean, it is impossible to eliminate the entrepreneur from the picture of a market economy. So the idea of doing an entire treatise on economic theory without mentioning the word entrepreneur would have seemed very bizarre to Mises. He continues, the various complementary factors of production cannot come together spontaneously. They need to be combined by, by the purposive efforts of men aiming at certain ends and motivated by the urge to improve their state of satisfaction. In eliminating the entrepreneur, one eliminates the driving force of the whole market system. So those of you who have read Mises, those of you who have studied economics, Austrian economics, recognize this notion in the, in the middle of the quotation of you know, human actors striving to improve their state of satisfaction, in Misesian terms, to remove uneasiness uh, by employing certain means to achieve ends, right? Mises describes that as the function of the entrepreneur in a market system. And he points out that, uh, uh, you know, if we did not completely understand the entrepreneur 
if we not, did, did not adequately conceptualize the entrepreneur, we would not be able to explain the market system itself. So let's unpack this idea a little bit with reference to things that we learned yesterday and things that most of you probably knew before you came. Um, entrepreneurship really fits in with the Austrian theory of production, the Austrian notion of production. Right, so production theory starts with the idea of inputs and outputs, or more generally, means and ends. Right, human action involves employing uh, uh, means to achieve desired ends, or in uh, the language of production theory, combining and recombining scarce inputs in an attempt to produce particular kinds of outputs. Right? So we know that economic goods can be distinguished, as Carl Menger distinguished them, between so-called original factors of production, land and labor, uh, intermediate goods, goods that are produced by human actors but are not themselves the final end of, cons uh, of the production process, but are used to produce yet other goods and services until we reach the final goods that are consumed directly. And of course, in a world of complex factors of production, in a world with a variety of different kinds of original factors, labor in particular, uh, we produce a large number of intermediate goods which can be combined into yet a larger number of final goods. So, you know, how to produce a particular set of final goods in the most efficient way is not at all obvious. It may be obvious to Robinson Crusoe on his desert island, it may not be. Even Crusoe may, dis may, may realize there are many ways to make a fishing pole. Different kinds of wood, you can make it longer or shorter, it can be tipped with you know, a rock, or it can be tipped with a piece of metal or whatever. Uh, he can you know, try to produce a lot of them at the same time. He can go slowly and only produce one, sort of more handcrafted production. Uh, even Crusoe typically faces a variety of different production methods and must choose among them, is trying to choose the most efficient one. Production, of course, takes place through time, right? This is a you know, stylized version of the Hayekian triangle. And I know this, this uh, simple graphic does not quite meet the, the Roger Garrison standard for graphical sophistication, although I will say in my defense, as I was putting this lecture together, I you know, just did a Google image search for Hayekian triangle and picked the first thing that came up, and then I noticed the URL was www.auburn.edu slash garrison something. So, uh, production takes time, right? So when, at the moment when we Im first employ means to achieve our ends, right, we don't get the ends instantaneously, and there is some uncertainty about whether the precise ends to which we aim, at which we aim, will actually be realized. Um, most of you are already familiar with uh, the so-called theory of imputation, which is one of the great achievements of the Austrian school in, in the 19th, early 20th century, and widely recognized by all economists as being a distinct Austrian contribution, right? the idea that the value of the means of production is imputed from the value of the ends that are achieved by production, right? So, uh, 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 you know, champagne isn't expensive because uh, the, the, the land that is used to grow the grapes to produce champagne in that particular region of France is very expensive land, right? Rather, the causation runs the other way around, right? Land in the champagne-growing regions of France is very expensive because consumers place a high valuation on a glass of real champagne, and the value of the drink is imputed backwards to the value of the land, rather than sort of the Marxist view, right, or the labor theory of value to which even Adam Smith uh, fell victim, uh, which uh, asserts that the value of consumer goods and the prices of consumer goods are determined by the values and prices of the factors used to produce them. That's got it exactly backwards, right? And uh, uh, We'll talk in just a moment a little bit more detail about the notions of marginal product and marginal revenue product. Right? The marginal product of a factor is the contribution to production of a, a, an additional unit of that factor or service. The marginal revenue product is a way of expressing 
the marginal product in monetary terms, right? So if one more parcel of land can produce, you know, $100,000 worth of champagne, then the value of that marginal parcel of land is, can be no greater than $100,000. Would also be, presumably be discounted uh, depending on the amount of time it takes to go from land to drink. Okay. Most of you have studied this notion of production, if not in Austrian texts, even in your mainstream economics courses. You've heard a version of production theory that is not entirely different from this. But one thing that is typically left out of mainstream production theory is who is actually doing all this? Who is organizing production? Who is making the decisions to combine this parcel of land with these seeds and this fertilizer and this kind of labor and these machines and so forth to produce eventually over many stages a, a nice refreshing bubbly drink that we can hold in our hand. And, you know, we're going to have a champagne party at the end of Mises U. You, you know that, right? That's sort of our end of, end of the week celebration. Although maybe it's, uh, maybe it's Budweiser, I can't remember. Um, <laughs> who is organizing production? And where do profits come from? Right? If all production is organized perfectly, right, such that Factors of production are priced according to their marginal revenue products. Uh, then all of the value of production is imputed back to the factors. There's nothing left over for profits or losses. But we know that in the real world, firms do earn profits and other firms earn losses. I mean, how can this be? How can we explain this? Uh, remember, profit for Austrian economists Right, is a function that only exists in a state of disequilibrium. Profits only exist in disequilibrium, likewise for losses. Right, in, in a notion of, uh, you know, Mises and Rothbard use this construct of the evenly rotating economy, or ERE, but you can just think of that as a sort of long-run equilibrium state. Um, in this long-run equilibrium state, hypothetical state, uh, each factor of production earns exactly its marginal revenue product discounted uh, according to time preference, depending on the length of time between when that factor is paid and when the final goods and services are sold to the consumers. Right? So that piece of land that contributes exactly $100,000 to, uh, uh, to, to the owner's uh, amount of champagne, to the, to the re champagne revenues from the champagne producer, We'll, buy, we'll trade for exactly $100,000 on the land market. Okay? Workers will be paid a wage that is exactly equal to the discounted value of their marginal contribution to production. Those who own and manage firms will also get some kind of a financial return, right? Because they're managing the firm as a, as kind of like a labor service. Right? So owner-managers will get to keep a little bit of the firm's revenues determined by sort of the value of what they could earn in the market if they chose to become laborers rather than and work for someone else rather than manage their own firm. You can think of that as an opportunity wage, or Rothbard uses the term implicit wage. Capitalists, those who lend money to producers in advance of production, are paid their uh, principal plus interest. Right? So in this long-run equilibrium state, workers will earn wages. Uh, landowners will be paid a land rent. All of those things determined by discounted marginal revenue product. Owner-managers will earn an implicit wage. Capitalists will earn interest. And that's it. Right? There's nothing left. All of the receipts from production will be distributed among those factors, those inputs, according to uh, these, uh, these particular relationships. Of course, outside the evenly rotating economy, in the real world, the day-to-day -day world of disequilibrium, we find that sometimes workers earn a wage that is higher or lower than their eventual realized marginal revenue product, suitably discounted. Some capitalists will be paid more or less than what they could have earned if they had employed their capital in an alternative use. 
Why? Because people make mistakes. When the champagne producer goes out into the labor market and offers wages to champagne workers, uh, that, that, that uh, he or she doesn't know exactly how much revenues will be realized a year later in the sale of champagne. Right? There's an estimate of what the champagne will sell for on the market. From that, I estimate what I think your marginal revenue product will be, and I offer you a wage associated with your discounted marginal revenue product, but I might be wrong. I mean, maybe by the time the champagne uh, becomes available in stores, consumers will have changed their preferences towards uh, you know, non-alcoholic drinks or different kinds of alcoholic drinks, or maybe the economy will be in recession, people will have less disposable income to spend on champagne, or maybe more. Right? I could get it wrong. So no one knows ex ante exactly what the realized marginal revenue products will be ex post. It's, a, it's an estimate, but those estimates can be right or wrong. And of course, if I, as the person coordinating this process, if I'm able to purchase factors of production at prices that will be below the marginal revenue they ultimately generate, then I have some extra money left over. Right? So it may be the case that once I go to sell my product, I've already paid all my factors of production, I've accounted for my implicit wage, I've paid any interest payments that are due to capitalists, I may still have some money left over in my pocket. That, of course, is what we call profit. That's entrepreneurial profit. Um, and the converse may be true also. I may have, it, may, it may turn out that I've overpaid for my factors of production. I end up with l less revenues than I anticipated, and I have an economic <coughs> loss. And you know, it doesn't take much thinking about business to realize that firms earn losses all the time. Um, and we typically don't think about those, or we quickly forget because you know, failed products sort of wash away from our memories. And we, we tend to remember the successful products and services because we're using them, and we're dealing with them all the time, and we often forget the unsuccessful ones. Um, you know, we talk about Apple and the iPad and the iPhone, uh, iPod, you know, being sort of phenomenal success because I just look around the room and, you know, there's 50 iOS devices or more probably in the room right now. Uh, or, you know, Air Jordans or something like that. Nike has had a lot of very successful campaigns to market particular kinds of, uh, you know, athletic footwear. But, you know, we also should keep in mind the numerous failures that have been just as significant in business history as these successes. Um, some of you old timers will remember the Edsel. I mean, David Gordon was one of the first to buy an Edsel when it came off the assembly line in <laughs> 1952. He probably still has it. You know, this was uh, uh, almost you know the death of the Ford Motor Company back in the 1950s. Um, anybody remember the new Coke <laughs> back in the 1980s? I think about 1985, uh, Coca-Cola thought it would be a good idea to change the formula for Coca-Cola. This was not a diet drink or a you know energy drink. This was just plain old Coke but they changed the formula and they called it New Coke. It was a huge expensive advertising campaign. It was a total flop. Consumers hated it, so they brought back the old Coke as what they called Coca-Cola Classic. And then eventually they phased out New Coke and Coca-Cola Classic just became Coke. Um, everybody remembers the, uh, you know, the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad, but not many people remember the Newton. So the Newton was Steve Jobs' first attempt in the uh, mid-1990s to produce a handheld computing device. Of course, it was pretty primitive compared to the devices that we have today. It had a little stylus. Of course, it wasn't networked to anything. There's no internet, but you could keep your contacts on it and you could make appointments and so forth. It was a complete disaster, complete flop. Um, so, so you know, the idea of you know, people like Steve Jobs you're having this sort of um, you know, almost magical ability to foresee the future and to produce those goods and services that consumers will love. Or, in the famous uh, oft an oft-quoted line of Steve Jobs, you know, Jobs once said, uh, you know, consumers don't know what they want until I tell them. Okay, this notion that he could sort of create consumer demand 
through advertising and clever marketing and so forth. I mean, Apple really is a brilliant marketing company, probably more so than a technology company. Uh, but you, know, you might think, oh, that sounds like it goes against the quote that DiLorenzo used on opening night about the consumers being you know, captain of the ship. But of course, we're, we're, we're at the case that Steve Jobs could create demand through his own persona and so forth, then we wouldn't have the Newton or, or the next computer, which is another one of Steve Jobs' great failures in the 1980s. So, you know, they're, they're, my point is there are just as many failures as successes. Maybe the new Terminator movie, Terminator Genesis, which cost, you know, $300 million to make and was a total flop at the box office a couple weeks ago would be another good example, right? So we can't only think about profits, we must also think about losses. So anytime you hear your professor or your friend talk about capitalism as a profit system, be sure and correct them, politely of course, right? Not obnoxiously, and say, ah, it's better described as a profit and loss system. You know, the reason why that is important is not just, you know, to be a you know, terminology Nazi or whatever, but uh, because this notion, oh, we have a profit system, misleads people into thinking that profits are easy to obtain. All you got to do is set up shop, and the profits will just come rolling in, okay? If we get people into the mindset of thinking about a profit and loss system, they will realize, oh, mm, er, I'm not quite sure I want to try that, okay? Or boy, you know, for every you know, wealthy, successful entrepreneur that I envy and want to you know, tax and regulate and so forth, you know, there are just as many or more unsuccessful ones uh, you know, whom I should pity and, and subsidize. No, no, we don't subsidize them either. But, um, <laughs> So let me just take a brief detour to talk about uncertainty and to distinguish uncertainty from risk, because I've mentioned the uncertainty that is inherent in, in our actions already. Um, the American economist Frank Knight, who was no friend of the Austrian school, uh, but whose work I think is very useful to us in understanding entrepreneurship, famously distinguished between risk and uncertainty. And Knight used... Uh, Knight defined risk as you know, situations in which uh, we don't know exactly what will happen in the future, but, but, but we have a, you know, a pretty good understanding of the problem. We understand the processes by which various outcomes are produced, and we can write down a you know, probability distribution function over the space of possible outcomes. You know, for example, casino gambling. Right? When I throw the dice, when I throw a die, I don't know exactly what number will come up, but if it's a normal die, I know that there are six possible numbers, and the probability of any one number coming up is one-sixth, and you know, I can sort of estimate how much I want to bet, or whether I want to do a certain thing based on an outcome of the roll of the dice, uh, by sort of doing a mathematical computation, right? I can calculate ex the expected return of doing this, the expected value of doing that, if the probabilities are known and objective. However, according to Knight, there are other situations in which we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, and we cannot really articulate the problem in terms of uh, uh, you know, probability theory, right? So I, I, you know, I, I don't know the probabilities of any particular outcomes occurring, and it may be the case that I can't even articulate the set of possible outcomes. Right, so these are situations like, you know, uh, you know, tomorrow will I meet the person of my dreams and fall hopelessly in love? I mean, you know, you, you can't go to the back of your stat textbook and look up the distribution function <laughs> and estimate, oh yes, okay, this, this can happen with probability point six, therefore I should get a haircut today, right? I mean, it's not, it's not that kind of decision. Um, likewise, for Steve Jobs, you know, if I introduce a handheld electronic computing device, will I become a bazillionaire or will it flop? I mean, there's no, you know, table of probability distributions that Steve Jobs can consult to know whether or not he should take the plunge and actually go into production and design and, and produce and try to sell these things or not. Um, Ludwig von Mises uh, had a younger brother named Richard von Mises, who was a famous mathematician and probability theorist who, who taught at Harvard in the 1930s. Uh, 
Richard von Mises used a slightly different kind of terminology that is also adopted by Ludwig von Mises in Human Action. So if you read Human Action carefully, you'll notice Mises, the, the older Mises, distinguishing between what he called class probability and case probability. And he gets this terminology from his younger brother, though interestingly he doesn't cite the younger brother's work because <laughs> apparently they did not get along. There were some, there were some family issues there. Um, uh, so what uh, uh, the younger Mises, Richard von Mises, called class probability, refers to a situation where a particular event can be described as part of a class of similar and repeatable events. In other words, you know, my throw of a die right now at this moment, you know, I mean, it, in some sense that's a unique event, right? I mean, it's, there's only one of me and this moment in time cannot be repeated and there's particular, you know, atmospheric pressure and the direction of the wind and the temperature in the room and the composition of the dye and other materials that make this in some sense kind of a unique event, but for all practical purposes, those peculiarities don't matter, right? And from the point of view of thinking about casino gambling, it's useful to conceive of each throw of the die being simply one member of a set that includes all throwing of a normal, unweighted, you know, die. Right? So according to Richard von Mises, the reason we know that the likelihood that a three will come up is one-sixth is because we could, in principle, you know, throw a die a million times or a billion times. We could just perform the experiment and write down what numbers come up each time. And if we do this experiment long enough, we'll find that a three comes up one-sixth of the time and a five comes up one-sixth of the time and so on. And so in the limit, if you think about this mathematically, right? In the limit, the likelihood of any particular number coming up is one-sixth, okay? Insurance works largely according to these same lines, right? I mean, every, every house is unique in some sense, but from the point of view of the insurance company, you know, houses can be bundled into groups of houses that are in a similar town, that are built of similar materials, that have a similar kind of electrical system, that have a sprinkler or don't have a sprinkler system, and so forth. So, you know, the ins uh, my, I have my homeowner's insurance through State Farm, and I do talk to Jake in the, in the, in the night, but um, <laughs> you know, State Farm doesn't know the exact likelihood that my house will catch on fire tonight, right? But it knows from, you know, collecting data over long periods of time of houses in this town that are built out of these materials and are about this age and so forth, you know, about how many of them catch fire on a given night. They have you know, many, many years of actuarial data on house fires. From that, they estimate what is the likelihood that my, my house in particular will catch on fire. Because they consider my house catching on fire to be a member of the set of houses with similar characteristics catching on fire. And so they will offer me an insurance policy, right, where I can, such that I can pool my risk with the owners of similar houses, and we all put in a little bit of money each month, and the insurance company pays out to those of us whose houses do actually catch on fire. Okay. There are other situations in which each event is so unique that it cannot meaningfully be considered part of a larger class. Right? So while you know, starting, a, starting a company, me starting a company is, you know, in one sense, it's part of the class of people starting companies. But each company is so unique, the circumstances are so idiosyncratic that we can't pool all of those into one set and say, oh, well, you know, uh, in the U.S., you know, 40% of all new businesses fail within the first six months, therefore P equals 0.4 for you. No, I mean, each case is so different that we cannot meaningfully speak of a homogeneous class of events. Business profit and loss, you know, falling in love, creating a great work of art, whatever. These are unique events uh, that cannot be thought of as members of a homogeneous class. So you can't buy insurance on you know, the likelihood that you'll fall in love. No one, no one will sell you a policy that will pay off if you don't fall in love. <laughs> 
there's no actuarial data that would support uh, uh, you know, this kind of treatment of uncertainty. So uh, my, my point is uh, what Frank Knight calls risk, the Mises brothers call class probability. What Frank Knight calls uncertainty, the Mises brothers call case probability. And so you will encounter the terms class probability and case probability in your reading of Mises and other Austrian economists. But the more common terminology, what is more or less the same thing, is Knight's notion of risk and uncertainty. Well, why am I spending time on this? Well, something that you should know. But also understanding the difference between risk and uncertainty is critical to our understanding of entrepreneurial profit and loss. Okay, so entrepreneurship in the broad sense, in the most general sense, refers to human action under uncertainty. The bearing of uncertainty that is involved any time each of us engages in action. According to Mises, the term entrepreneur, as used by economic theory, means acting man exclusively seen from the aspect of the uncertainty inherent in every action. So you could say in Misesian terminology that your decision to come to the lecture this morning was an entrepreneurial decision because you have to employ scarce means, your time most obviously, uh, maybe it cost you something to get here and gas money or uh, you had to walk and expend some energy or whatever. Of course, but again, as I say, the opportunity cost of your time is certainly important. Um, you know, my hope is that at the end of the lecture, you will say, wow, that was the best entrepreneurship lecture I've ever heard. Probably some of you have never heard one before, so you will say that. Um, you know, this, this is so much more valuable than anything I could have been doing with my hour, like sleeping or whatever. Uh, you know, so in a sense, you earned a profit. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a mental profit, a psychic profit. But if you, if you value the ends that you achieved by spending your time here in this lecture greater than the opportunity cost of the means, you know, you got more than what you paid. You earned a profit in this general sense. I mean, it's possible, extremely unlikely, of course, but possible that some of you may say, you know, that was terrible. That was the worst thing I ever heard. I would have been much better off sleeping or you know, watching TV or whatever, watching Netflix back in the dorm, uh, and you would, you know, maybe you would say you earned a loss. Okay, again, it's, it's kind of a psychological thing. It's not a material manifest thing. But we can apply the concept of profit and loss to our everyday action. Of course, most of the time in economics and in history, we're not really interested in that kind of entrepreneurship, right? We're interested in commercial entrepreneurship. Right? We're interested in those human actors who specialize in purchasing productive resources, combining them in particular ways to achieve goods and services, to produce goods and services that they will then offer to consumers for sale, trying to earn monetary profit and trying to avoid monetary loss. So I, I, I call this you know, entrepreneurship in the narrow sense or the commercial sense. Right? Uh, the Austrian economist Ludwig Lachmann described it as follows. We are living in a world of unexpected change, i.e. Knightian uncertainty, or Misesian uh, case probability. Hence, capital combinations, resource combinations, will be ever-changing, will be dissolved and reformed. In this activity, we find the real function of the entrepreneur. So the real function of the entrepreneur in a market economy is this constant combination, dissolution, and recombination of productive resources in an attempt to achieve monetary profit and to avoid monetary loss. Uh, this is what Mises meant in the quote that I showed you before in describing the entrepreneur as the driving force of a market economy. Now, uh, in doing so, the entrepreneur employs the specific tool of economic calculation or monetary calculation. And I believe the lecture immediately following this one will be Joe Salerno's lecture uh, on economic calculation. And one of the things I want you to listen for, I, I don't know how much he'll emphasize this, is the idea, is the extent to which you know, Mises' uh, theory of economic calcul calculation 
though expressed by Mises in the context of socialism, and socialism versus capitalism, is not essentially you know, a theory about socialism. It's a theory about how entrepreneurs try to combine and recombine resources in a world of uncertainty. It happens to be a particularly important problem in the context of socialism, because under socialism you don't have capital markets, you don't have factor markets, you don't have prices for labor and land and capital goods. And so there's no way for the entrepreneur to make these decisions about how to allocate resources efficiently. Okay? Um, I also want you to keep in mind, as I've emphasized already, that the act of engaging in entrepreneurship is not the same thing as describing particular entrepreneurs as successful or not. In other words, entrepreneurship is the act of bearing uncertainty, the act of resource combination under uncertainty, whether it is successful or not. Uh, this is particularly important uh, with, uh, in thinking of, thinking of profit and loss. Right? So one can engage in entrepreneurship, one can be an entrepreneur without making money. You might be unsuccessful at being a narrow commercial entrepreneur. Now you can't probably go on doing that forever because eventually you'll run out of resources. You'll run out of capital, you'll spend all your accumulated capital, you can't be an entrepreneur anymore. So it can't sort of go on indefinitely, but even the entrepreneur who consistently makes losses over some period of time is still an entrepreneur, is still engaged in entrepreneurship. Of course, there's a sort of a Darwinian selection process in the market, right, that uh, uh, rewards those who are successful at entrepreneurship while disciplining those who are unsuccessful. Um, I'm going to skip a couple of points because uh, we're about out of time, but just sort of summarize with this. You know, he, what are some things that, some ways that entrepreneurship is often described in the literature that I think are confusing or misleading? Right, so I, I want to emphasize that entrepreneurship in the Misesian sense, in the Austrian sense, is not limited to things like small business management and startups. If you read Entrepreneur magazine, or you take an entrepreneurship course at a mainstream university in a business school, they will probably say, well, the domain of entrepreneurship is small business management and startups. So for Austrian economists, right, running a small business or starting a new business, those certainly are entrepreneurial acts, but, but they're not exclusively, they're not the only entrepreneurial acts, right? Uh, owning and and organizing and coordinating a large business, an existing business, is also an entrepreneurial act. Running an ongoing enterprise as well as a new enterprise is entrepreneurial. Notice there's nothing in the definitions on the, from the previous slide that refer specifically to the size of the company or the age of the company. Um, nor is entrepreneurship limited, nor is the domain of entrepreneurship limited to novelty, innovation, uh, as in Joseph Schumpeter's notion of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs may be charismatic, they may exhibit creativity and leadership skills, but not necessarily so. That's not required as part of being an entrepreneur. Um, nor is it useful, in my view, to think of entrepreneurship as the discovery of pre-existing profit opportunities. This is a kind of an interpretation, really a misinterpretation, I think, of what the well-known modern Austrian economist Israel Kirzner has in mind with his account of entrepreneurial discovery. Um, nor do I think entrepreneurship is something you can learn in school. I mean, you can learn about entrepreneurship in school. That's what we're doing now. Uh, you can read a book on entrepreneurship theory. I, in particular, recommend this one. Uh, but there's some other good ones too. Uh, you can study the great entrepreneurs of the past. You can, you can theorize about entrepreneurs and so forth. But reading books and taking courses is not a substitute for exercising entrepreneurial judgment, right? For analyzing the future, for forming estimates of what the results of your action will be. What Mises and Knight called judgment, others have called intuition or gut, gut feeling, gut instinct or Verstehen, to use the German term, 
right? That is not something that you can learn from reading a book or that you can learn from taking a course. And uh, something that we can discuss later on in the week, uh, nor do I think entrepreneurship in the Misesian sense is something that the government can create or encourage or stimulate or steer through particular kinds of tax and regulatory policies or uh, by directly you know, subsidizing small companies or electric green companies or whatever. I mean, poor Nikolai Tesla, not Nikolai Tesla, but uh, Elon Musk, uh, you know, is, is in one sense a great entrepreneur, but is also sort of a welfare bum in that uh, his, his entrepreneurial efforts have been critically dependent on government uh, subsidy. So you'll be hearing more about entrepreneurship and other contexts in your courses during the week, but I hope this will give you some foundation for th different ways to think about entrepreneurship in, particularly, in particular, the way that we find in Mises and the other Austrians. Thanks. <laughs>